uh, first of all, my uh, my uh, sincerest appreciation to the to PIDS for uh, selecting this uh, this team and also bringing the discussion back to the election in 2014. Uh, indeed, uh, that is actually what I use for my for my title here. That growing and strengthening the middle class is actually the path to ambition at in 2040. And thank you also to uh, Dr. Tuts Albert for um, for that overview of uh, the the middle class, defining the middle class and characteristics of the middle class. Actually, back in I think it was in 1996 or 1997 when uh, Dr. Jock Yap and I, and actually uh, uh, see Ermi, Ermi uh, Yap, uh, we actually did also a paper on defining the middle class. And uh, so that was one of the first attempts to define the middle class in the Philippines. And uh, using empirical data, uh, using cluster analysis, and uh, using the Mahalanobis distance uh, to differentiate the different the, the classes in the Philippines, we actually came up with the um, with the cutoffs where the middle class would be uh, the lower middle class would be between the, the five times the poverty line up to seven times the poverty line. And then the upper middle class would be the seven times until the nine times of the poverty line. Now, of course, that one needs to be uh, to be updated as well. But I would think that uh, uh, there's you know, there's already uh, some literature on that, and therefore uh, we leave it up to the uh, to the researchers uh, because this is actually a crucial, as you know, a crucial strategy for growth, especially inclusive. So let me just proceed. Yes. Okay. So, so this one, I simply want to say that actually. Growing the middle class is the path to ambition at in 2040. And this is my main, main message for this uh, for this talk. But uh, before that, uh, of course, when you grow the middle class, obviously that means you reduce poverty. And then strengthening the middle class is another uh, 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 another uh, uh, matter to run. But uh, before I proceed further, I I really need to address the uh, elephant in the room and uh, <laughs> settle the uh, the controversies that we have with respect to uh, defining what is the poor. But of course, I'm here preaching to the choir, so this may still be a major medalla. But anyway, just to say that we recognize we at the Nether recognize that poverty is multidimensional. It actually uh, it looks at uh, it, it's actually about uh, several um, several causes, several reasons, and therefore requires also you know different uh, different measures. There is of course the monetary approach to defining poverty, and this one simply is uh, defines it in terms of uh, what is the money or insufficient. It's defined as uh, insufficient money to pay for a minimum of the necessities of life. And then there's the uh, the other uh, thought. The, this one is by uh, Amartya Sen, the Nobel laureate, which uh, actually takes on the capability approach and is concerned with uh, evaluating in terms of his or her actual ability to achieve various valuable functioning as part of living. So for a Martisan, it's really about being what you want to be and doing what you want to do. And therefore, um, poverty is about not being able to be what you want to be and doing what you want to be. But then there is this, uh, this other one, which is about social inclusion, where poverty in this case refers to the dynamic process of being shut out fully, being deprived or partially from any social, economic, political, or cultural systems. So this is really the deprivation uh, part of it, or the exclusion, the social exclusion uh, dimension of poverty, which of course we can say is actually an outcome of poverty. And then there's also this participatory approach, 
where in this case, it is based on what constitutes the circumstances of the poor. And thus, the definition of poverty is seen to spring from the way poor people actually analyze their own reality. And this is um, uh, usually uh, measured in terms of you know, self-rating. This is the self-rated poverty uh, of the students. Now, in our case, this is actually how we define poverty. It's really in terms of the means approach or the income approach. So this is actually the uh, this taken from the PSA website. The poverty is a characteristic of the family. So this is something that we also need to emphasize here, that uh, we define poverty whenever we actually compute for the poverty stats whenever we conduct the family income and expenditure survey and all the questions that are pertain to the family. So, uh, so thus, if a family is classified as poor, then all the members of the family will be counted as poor. In other words, a family cannot have poor and non-poor members. So either all members are poor or all members are not poor. So that is one thing that we have to uh, specify here. Uh, one of the controversies really is, you know, dividing up the the the, the threshold on a per capita per person or a per person per day. You know. So it has to be uh, in terms of the family. Now, um, what we want as well uh, when we say that, uh, you know, we want actually to reduce poverty incidence as measured by the same metric. So this one, let's say, just for illustration purposes. So you have here, let's say, a frequency distribution. And uh, let's say that that Z is actually the poverty line. And then uh, you have on the on the X axis, the per capita income. And then on the Y is your uh, frequency. And then let's have that as the income distribution. And therefore, uh, the proportion of that distribution that is uh, to the left of the Z is the poverty incidence. Now, in terms of our uh, topic right now, there is that nine, let's say an M, representing the cutoff for the middle class. So probably anywhere in between Z and M would be the middle class. Now, what we want to achieve is really um, at the, what, what we call that? It's really shifting, shifting that distribution towards the right of that Z. So that the, so if you consider only that, that, that the distribution curve, so it's really about reducing the incidence of uh, the proportion of people who will be to the left of Z. Now, later on, most probably we will need to redefine the Z. But for now, I said that, uh, you know, given that we're just recovering from the pandemic, it's still too soon. It's still, uh, it's not yet a normal year for us to be redefining that Z. Nonetheless, the, the objective is still to reduce that poverty incidence into single digits by 2020. So just to go back, and this one is also going to the topic of uh, how do you now strengthen? First of all, grow the middle class, and then of course, strengthen it. So we realized that this poverty, this middle class, this rich is actually part of a wider spectrum of well-being. So this is actually a framework that we have used a long, long time ago. It has uh, actually been approved over, over time. And this one actually begins with um, looking at the decision of the individual to participate in economic activity, either through the labor supply or through entrepreneurial activities. So this one is defined, it's actually um, affected by uh, a labor policy, the entrepreneurship policy, credit and business tax policy, and of course, business confidence. And that is how you determine whether, and that is what will determine whether an individual will want to participate in economic activity. So 
given that uh, he participated in the economic activity, then this one actually, this individual uh, or the household will be earning income. Now, this income though could be um, increased or decreased depending on the transfers, net transfers, and then subsidies, and then the income tax policy. So like what happened during the train one, implementation of the train one. We expanded the same labor supply, and yet we actually had more disposable income. And that's really because of the reduction in the income tax rate. Now this income is either saved or spent. So, and what determines that would be the monetary policy, including incentives to save, access to markets, and of course the consumer confidence. And then what is spent is now largely determines your consumption. But of course, not all of spending goes into consumption. There's still wastage. And of course, depending also on the prices, the consumption tax policy and the availability of public services, which is very important. So when we actually had this uh, UAQPE, so even if you did not spend on education services, you can still consume education services if you took advantage of the publicly provided education services. Same is true with the healthcare. So even if you do not provide, we did not spend, for instance, uh, uh, as a, well, pers on a personal level, we did not spend for the vaccines uh, during the COVID, but because it was publicly provided, we were able to consume it. So this consumption is actually what brings about the outcomes, where the outcomes is really about the asset buildup, the asset buildup of human capital, physical capital, and financial capital. And then, of course, the outcomes, which are in terms of the life comforts, good health, and good education. But of course, it does not, you know, uh, the, again, the translates, translation is not one for one. It really depends on the preferences and the quality of consumption. So like if you spend, let's say you consume a lot of food, it does not necessarily translate to good health if it is not the nutritious food that you eat. So, you know, classic. And then, we think that this one actually is what determines the perception of well-being, the life comforts that the individual is enjoying or the family is enjoying. Another thing is that uh, aside from these outcomes, aside from these life comforts, there's still that, uh, you know, that um, uh, intervention by the culture, values and other aspects of well-being. In the case of the Philippines, we think that this one is really about being able to enjoy a maginhawa, a matatag maginhawa at panatag buhay. Now, we should also note that the previous period's asset buildup is actually what will also determine this period's decision regarding labor supply or entrepreneurial activity. And then, of course, there's also the aspect of the access to markets, which is now uh, affected by infrastructure, trade, transport, logistics, and innovation. Now, now just to say, just to complete this uh, illustration, these are the four aspects. This is actually how we define, perceive, or even measure poverty. You can have an income measure, which is what we have in the Philippines, an expenditure measure, which is usually what is being done in other countries. And then you have the outcome-based measures and then the uh, perception-based measure. So just to be clear that what we are measuring is that one, but we realize that there are uh, several determinants leading up to that perception of well-being. And also just to say that there are already efforts to measure the outcome-based measure, okay, the outcome-based poverty, and also this uh, uh, about the quality of life. 
uh, it's just that uh, we have not yet, uh, we're not yet done with that study. So anyway, going back to the middle class. So growing the, growing the middle class is really about reducing poverty. Now we need to strengthen the middle class. So I would say that it's really about moving about uh, focusing our strategies to achieving this ambition at in 2040. So this was an effort that was done in 2015, 2016, when we asked Filipinos, what is it that you want to do, want to be, and want to have by 2040? So that's 25 years from the time that we did it, roughly a generation away. So roughly that would be uh, the age gap between your parent and yourself. So this is the summation of that ambition at in 2014. Our family is together. We have time with friends. We enjoy work-life balance and a strong sense of community. That's matatag. Maginhawa, free from hunger and poverty. We live in a decent house with a secure long-term tenure. Good transport and mobility options travel and vacation opportunities, quality education, and a decent job for the Maginhawa, and then for the Panatag, savings. We have enough resources for day-to-day -day needs and unexpected expenses. We enjoy peace and security, a long and healthy life, and comfortable retirement. Now, what we did next, and this one is already updated to uh, new prices, is how much did it take to be able to enjoy this matatag, maginhawa, panatag na buhay. Now, just a disclaimer here. Uh, this is not based on a scientific study. So this is just, you know, major Delphi technical. So, first of all, own a car. And this one will come up to, let's say, an amortization or depreciation cost plus low M of about 25000 per month. Oh, by the way, it's a family of four. I didn't pay the way. Next. And then, sorry. You have uh, money for day-to-day -day needs, let's say 50000 a month. A medium-sized home, 26000 that will be the amortization that you will need for a middle-sized home, say for 20 years. And then, you educate your children. You send them to a private school because you think that uh, it's the one that will give them the quality education. Okay. Uh, you want to uh, spend also for, you know, having time with uh, family and friends, let's say 10000 a month, and then save up for that grand vacation of 8000 a month so that at the end of the year, you can have that grand vacation. This one comes up to a tax uh, implication of implies a tax of about 45,000, and this one actually gives you 194,000 pesos for a family of four per month. Too much, anyway. <laughs> next, so what we did next was to okay, what if we can have this comprehensive and enabling economic and social policy. For instance, let's have good transport. You don't need to own your own car. Let's have good transport options, safe, accessible, affordable. And let's say that uh, we were able to bring this down to 5,000 a month, let's say. And then let's have uh, very competitive industries that can bring down the prices of the goods that we want, okay, but quality. And so we're able to bring this down to, let's say, 40,000. Anyway, and then let's have a very, very competitive construction industry and a finance sector. Let's aim for that rate, uh, credit rating of A so that we bring down the sovereign risk, bring down that interest rate, and this one actually, we can bring this down to 12,500. Next, let's have quality education in our public schools so that you don't have to pay a lot for tuition fee. They can get quality education 
if they can if they can go to public schools and that will just be for allowance to pay five thousand a month. Next, let's have good parks, like in the uh, like in Australia, <laughs> like in uh, many European countries. Let's have good parks so that you don't need to spend ten thousand just to have a, a bonding time with your family and friends. You just need stacks two thousand pesos a month, and then. Let's have a very competitive tourism sector, and let's have you know let's let's clean up our beaches, let's clean up, clean up our rivers, so we we would have many more options to have this vacation malapit na. So let's just you know you just need to save five thousand, and then let's have a very very good uh, tax reform policy. Okay, let's complete that comprehensive tax reform package and bring down that tax implication to only 22500 And this one comes up to 92000 Still a lot. But, you know, a far cry from the 194 pesos, 194,000 pesos per month. And if it's a two-income earner, two-income earner, then it is actually more achievable. And that's the reason why even back in the previous PDT, we were really promoting and advocating heavily for increasing the female labor force participation rate, because we know that that is also a key to the ambition. Now, but can you remember all those assumptions that we have to put in so that we can bring down this ambition, the cost of achieving the ambition? And that's actually what has been guiding us in doing, in crafting the Philippine Development Plan. First of all, we need to invest in priority sectors that actually have a direct impact on our people's aspirations. So we're talking about housing and urban development, okay? the construction sector, all this manufacturing of construction-related uh, materials. We need manufacturing, of course. You need connectivity, digital and physical. You need a very, very modern agriculture sector, thank you, uh, which includes even the biotech. Tourism and allied services, we also want that. And like I said, sana medyo malapit lang. And financial services, let's have more competition also in financial services. We also need an enabling social policy. And this one, we have been doing this for every, you know, uh, what we call a vulnerable sector. Let's say this adolescent girl. What are the many things that can, you know, go well with her? First of all, she goes to school, quality education, finishes school, and then gets into a decent employment. That. And then adult marriage and also bears uh, healthy children, tapos securing, enjoy security of place, and then enjoys also work-life balance because of that work-life balance policies. And then my lifelong learning opportunities is In the end, she's able to achieve the demographic dividend. Now, what are the other things, you know, that can uh, go awry? <laughs> for this adolescent girl. First of all, child marriage or teenage pregnancy even. She leaves school because of that. And then repeat pregnancies, kasi bata pa. Then could be child illness, there could be even death, maternal mor morbidity and even mortality. If she can if she can work, it will only be it can only be informal work. Uh, there's insecurity and displacement, and it would be a missed demographic dividend. But what we're saying is that, you know, it doesn't have to be all the way like that and all the way bad, all the way good, all the way bad. No. If you have this enabling social policy in the middle, access to skilled birth attendant, you have uh, health systems and good health systems, you have um, child health investments, etc., then even though they would, uh, you know, sometimes detour to this uh, bad path, they can actually, we can actually bring them back. And 
you know, back to that good part. Another is that with respect to education, it really has to be quality education, not just access to education, but access to quality education, as also mentioned by uh, Dr. Fitzalbert earlier. So we're talking about having the foundational literacies, competencies, and character. So, so this is actually what we need to do. So given that, yes, thank you. <laughs> given this ladder, what we need really is many more strategies that will provide them more ladder rungs so that they're able to move up that social ladder. For the poor, we need that ladder to just, you know, take them, uh, get, get them out of that poverty, okay? But make sure that they are also, they also have the social protection. That's why we have the poor piece, for instance, that is conditioned on, that also provides for their human capital development and other stuff. And we also need the other, other uh, aspects in order to, you know, provide them that means to be able to move up that ladder. And that is actually how you strengthen the middle class. Now, just to say that in the previous PDP, this is actually what we have uh, said then, that it's really about laying the foundation for this ambition act in 2040. And we said then that there will be three pillars, malasakit, pagbabago, patuloy na pagbabago. And uh, for instance, um, strengthening the social fabric, uh, this is actually about improving also the confidence, building the confidence in institutions. Pagbabago is more about increasing access to the opportunities, increasing the opportunities and then the access to opportunities. Patuli na pagundad, this is really the first time that we had a chapter on science, technology, and innovation in the PDP. And actually, it continued until the next PDP. Now, these are actually those foundational policies that we have put in place, programs and policies that actually, you know, would make for uh, improving, for building those other in-between other runs. But of course, there's the pandemic. And therefore, what we did next was to come up with, okay, we know what is that life we want, the future we want, but what is the future that we do not want? And therefore, we also need to ensure that we come up with strategies so that we don't get to the future that we don't want. And we have these three. Masakuna, distress and disasters. Mabagal, slow to change. And then langit at muka, wider inequalities. We have actually come up also with strategies so that we avoid this future that we do not want. Many of them are included in the NIASD, which is the National Innovation Agenda and Strategy Document, and of course, this PDP. Now, this one is coming from Chandler Institute of Governance, which is uh, based in Singapore, one of the thought leaders promoting, actively promoting, actually, that uh, we really need a very uh, a big and a strong middle class. So they say that the middle class, which is fundamental, to a market economy embodies values like dedication, thrift, and prioritization of education. It's really because they know that it's education that will take them to that next level. So it's really important that we grow that middle class because it is the key to having a very, very well-educated population. But I would like you to, to see as well um, this ladder that they have actually come up with, where it begins with dreams and aspirations. And this is really about, you know, strengthening the middle class as well. They say that it has to begin with that, that everyone should have an aspiration. That's how you grow. And then the skills and the core values. And then you have for professional growth, the freedom to create, being an industry leader, and so on and so forth. And therefore, this is actually the uh, statement now of our um, long-term developmental goals. What has been uh, uh, mentioned earlier is actually the first of those um, development agenda, which is 
that by 2040, the Philippines will be a prosperous, predominantly middle-class society where no one is free. But we also want to bring in the other aspects, not just the economic aspects, but also the social, the cultural, institutional, etc. Our peoples are smart and innovative with high regard for sustainable development and quality of life. May malasakit. Our peoples will live long and productive lives and continue to nurture their gifts, talents, and passion contribute to society. And our peoples will live in a high trust and caring society and proudly identify themselves as Filipinos. And this is actually what we mean by strengthening that middle class. Now, I will not have time to uh, discuss then the the current PDP, but just to say that it's actually a PDP that is also geared towards the ambition, but also includes strategies so that we do not uh, get to the future that we do not want. And this is that we say that it's really about transforming economic and social transformation, which is about digital transformation, improving connectivity, uh, intensifying public-private partnerships, promoting servicification, establishing a dynamic innovation ecosystem, and then enhancing the role of LGUs as partners in development. And we think that this is really the key. This is really the key to, first of all, growing the middle class, and then next, to strengthen the middle class. So once again, thank you very much, and let's all be part of this growing and strengthening the middle class.